Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simiu, and joining me uh, in the man cave, Mike Stavrou. Welcome back, mate. How you doing? Hey, how are you, mate? Fresh trim there, looking good, man. Yes, I, I, I do try, I do try. I do look younger, don't I? <laughs> you that do, man. <laughs> but that's not what we're here to talk about, is it, Mike? We're here to talk about Arsenal. Um, let's talk about, first of all, our defensive issues, because... I know it's only pre-season and I know we shouldn't really read into, you know, pre-season results too much. As I always say, pre-season games are primarily about fitness. But we've seen um, lapses in concentration defensively again, uh, particularly last night in the Camp Nou. And overall, it was probably a pretty good performance. But we saw that towards the end, the defensive lapse again and we ended up losing the game. And again, I want to emphasize that I'm not too upset about the result because it was a friendly at the end of the day. But the issue here is is a lot deeper than that, isn't it? And this is a problem that unless we address it before the end of the transfer window, it is going to keep recurring through the season. At the time of recording, Arsenal have not signed anybody else. Nicolas Pepe was our last uh, acquisition. Mike, where do you stand on this? Um, I think it is a personal issue, Harry, but it's also a coaching issue. I think if Emery hasn't, uh, over the summer, put in place uh, the 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 coaching to be able to make these players better and improve them and positionally and how they can react to situations. And it's it's not going to happen. I mean, it's so much more about you know people screaming and saying sign a centre back, sign a centre back. It, I think actually, if you look at our defence, yes, it's not the best. It's not probably the best in the in the top six. Um, but they can all be improved. Like that's what coaches do; they improve players. And Mustafi, I don't rate him whatsoever. But could he put in a performance where Arsenal could defend as a collective unit better? Of course, they could. I mean, I just look back to the four-two against Spurs last season at home, and the way that we pressed from the front, and the way that we recover possession in midfield, which actually took away the emphasis on the back four. I mean, that's how you defend. You defend as a collective. It's not just about, about the back four. So we blame individuals. I mean, obviously, you know, we could do with a big leader um, so of like the sort of stature of Virgil van Dijk, someone that's going to come in and um, boss the team around and be that leader that we've lacked over all these years. But is it just a case of sign a centre-back and all our defensive woes uh, is suddenly gone? I mean, no. What would you think? No, I completely agree with you. And I've I've been, as you know, I've been critical of Unai Emery in the past. I've spoken about um, the fact that he brought in defenders initially when he arrived, the defensive-minded players, and we didn't improve defensively. And I think you're absolutely right. I think that that whole argument highlights the fact that it's not just about the personnel. It is about drilling the team properly. It is about communication, making sure that when both your fullbacks have gone forward, for example, one of your midfielders has the presence of mind to slot back into the defence or, you know, knowing that your centre-half's having to go out and cover his left-back, who's going to slot in and fill that gap? And it's those kind of things, it's those transitions and the shape that Arsenal are really struggling with and have been struggling with for a long, long time. I thought that when Unai Emery came in, we'd see an improvement in that area because I blamed Arsene Wenger for it previously. But it seems like... Unai Emery's not been able to embed that either, which kind of leads me to believe in that it's kind of 50-50, half the personnel, half the shape, half the, the management, because surely top-class experienced defenders should have the presence of mind to at times make those calls for themselves during a the game. They should spot those gaps themselves. They should fill in those holes. And whilst I, I completely agree that The team are not being set up right in many ways and the defensive shape is certainly not there. I find it very hard to solely blame the manager when you're seeing players make so many individual errors. And Mustafi's one you mentioned. I actually think that Mustafi, with a proper centre-half next to him, would be okay. Don't particularly rate the guy, but a lot of people were giving him shit after the Barcelona game last night. Luis Suarez got in, um, obviously scored the winner. But for me... As a centre half pairing, you've got to deal with Suarez. You got it's got to be one on him, one drop off. You know what he's going to do. It's one of the most recognisable strikers in world football, and it just felt like, whilst I'm not overreacting to a friendly because you shouldn't, 
that was a timely reminder of the fact that we've got a few days left in this window. And if we have real aspirations of getting back in the top four and challenging for trophies, that is an area that needs addressing. I mean, that's exactly what it is, isn't it? I think you're talking about the, the synchronicity of the, of the players together and knowing the plan. And because um, Chambers and Mustafi together, there was just no communication there, Harry. First of all, there's a massive gap between them, which there shouldn't be. And then Mustafi's trying to push up. Uh, Chambers hasn't reacted. And it's just the communication between them. And what I think has happened last season, Emery came in and was like, all right, this is how I want to play. This is what I'm going to do. We're going to play up from the back. We're going to press from the front. For some reason, over time, I don't know if it was injuries or um, he changed his philosophy and he started chopping and changing and over-managing the, the squad, I think. I mean, constantly different systems. One game would go to a 4-2-3-1, to a 4-3-3, three, 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 to a 3 at the back. And the players could never adapt to that and they never knew what the plan was. When you look at, at Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp, they have their formation, they have their personnel and it almost doesn't matter which way round that is as long as the player fits into that mould and that exact position and what the instructions are for that position, it, it doesn't matter who it is. Obviously, you can improve and some players will do things better than others. But for Arsenal, I just feel like that plan isn't in place. And I hope over this summer, what's happened is Unai Emery's had a chance to get some of the players he wants in, as in Pepe, which will help us play you know, with, with more width, which will only help us going forward, um, which means maybe the fullbacks don't bomb on, bomb on as much. Um and uh, in Danny Ceballos as well, that's someone who can fill the sort of void uh, left by Santi Cazorla, someone who makes that link between midfield and attack and feeds it into Ozil so he can pick up the ball higher at the pitch rather than having to drop deep. So it will be interesting to see how it all works out. But defensively, I mean, there's no doubt that we could benefit from having another big, experienced centre-back in there. I read a story just now, actually, that um, we had a €60 million Euro bid rejected for um for Upamecano from um RB Leipzig now 60 million um euro bid for a defender when we've already spent 72 million on Pepe like I'm liable not to believe that that's from build by the way which are build as the German son so let's let's take that w with a pinch of salt but I mean there's no doubt for me that a center back would come in and improve us but the thing is that you have to consider do you get someone as a stopgap until um, William Saliba comes in next season? Um, how many players do you have to ship out before we can actually get one in? Because if you think of it, we've got about seven centre-backs at the club at the moment. So would you even be able to bring one in? Interestingly as well, you've got to think about the Lauren Koscielny situation. What's going to happen with that? Is he going to be still at the Emirates? We we know that he wants to leave. We you know From Unai Emery's comments in recent weeks, we kind of gathered that the club were kind of set on moving him on. But somebody's got to stump up that transfer fee, haven't they? And that hasn't happened as of yet, to our knowledge. So we could be in a situation where we've got Koscielny there taking up a significant portion of our wage bill, which is maybe restricting us going out and getting somebody else. And and, and it's all a bit of a mess, sort you, of defensively. You to ask you an Emery question about that at the Emirates Cup last week, didn't you? I did. But someone asked the question about Sammy Kadira instead yeah. oh, for the last Jesus. question. I mean, <laughs> Harry was there with his hand up, like, please let me ask about Koscielny. It was the last question, and... That was a subject that needed addressing. Unai Emery had not given any update on that. And this bloody geezer at the back decides to stand up and say, oh, what about Sammy Kadir? Sammy Kadir has been at the Emirates countless times. We know he's not coming to Arsenal, for God's sake. What an absolute waste of a question. Two defenders Arsenal have been linked with for a while now are Kieran Tierney, uh, Celtic left-back, and Daniele Rugani from Juventus, a centre-half, of course, um, but the Kieran Tierney de deal sorry, is one that's dragged on for a while. We know that Arsenal have had two bids rejected by Celtic. Neil Lennon's come out and confirmed that himself. We know that Arsenal are very much interested in the player, but we've also heard in the last few days that Kieran Tierney is really struggling in his rehab uh, from his long-term injury. I think it was a hernia problem. Is this a deal that you think Arsenal will get over the line or is it time maybe to turn their attention to somebody else and would you rather a centre back or a left back if you could only get one in I mean I was always a bit perplexed about the price of Tierney and now it's starting to make sense because if he's got a sort of ongoing issue with, with his hernia he's just had an operation it's going to take a long time maybe that's why it's at a cut price Harry 
Maybe that's why it's around £25 million. So apparently the third bid will be lodged or has been lodged in the last few days. And Celtic, if it's, if the terms are correct with the money up front, which is around £20 million and five in instalments, they will accept it. So I think it's fair to say that deal will happen uh, before the end of the, of the deadline. In terms of the player we're getting um, as a left back, I mean, I would prioritise a centre back. But you you got to think it's quite a good deal because in terms of who we've got now, Nacho Monreal is ageing. Sarah Kalasinac, if we're going to play a four on the back, I don't really like him there as a defender. And uh, uh, from what I hear about you know people that watch Celtic uh, day in, day out, he's a fantastic defender, an even better defender than Andy Robertson. Maybe not as good going forward, but I remember he's only ousted out of that team because of him and how good has he been. So I'm excited to, to, to get him in, but the injuries do worry me because we've already got an injury record as it is. I mean, it seems that we sign players and their injuries suddenly get worse. Like Danny Welbeck, never had an issue at United, comes to Arsenal, suddenly has all these ankle issues and knee issues that we've never even heard of. So that that would worry me personally as a manager. And then what does that mean for, for Monreal? Class in actually, I don't know. Well, it's interesting because a lot of people, when I've sort of tweeted about the fact that Tierney's injury record isn't great, the, the response I've always got is, well, he's so-and-so years old and he's played X amount of games. And so that means it's not a concern. Well, th- that's in the past. We're talking about now. And Kieran Tierney quite clearly has an issue at the moment. There was reports the other day that he's, he's in pain when he uh, kicks the ball and things like that. And That's sort of important for a footballer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it, it's not just that for me. I, I think Kieran Tierney may well be a, a very good prospect. I'm not questioning that for a second. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm an expert on, on Scottish football or Celtic for that matter, because I'm not. But for me... If there is 25 million available to spend, then you've got to prioritise a centre back. I think that's a far more problematic area but for us. What centre backs can you get for that money, though? I mean, really, so you're going to be again bringing in either a youngster or someone who's mediocre, Harry. Like someone like Rugani. I know you've watched uh, bits of him and not necessarily impressed, have you been, by Rugani? No, I mean, Rugani's an interesting one because Rugani, um, when he first broke onto the scene, if I'm not mistaken, he was out on loan. Uh, one of the smaller clubs that it escapes me right now, but he done really well. And I think he got in the Serie A team of the year at one point. Um, but for me, Rugani went to Juventus and they expected him to be the next, you know, to to fit in with Bonucci, Bazzali, Chiellini, etc. And it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened for him at Juventus for whatever reason. He hasn't progressed at the rate that he was expected to progress. And now, you know, with Delict coming in as well, it could be time for Juventus to let him go. But would he be better than some of the options we've already got? I think he would. I think he'd be uh, better than maybe a Callum Chambers or a Shkodran Mustafi. But do you want to go and spend that sort of money on, like you said earlier on, a stopgap? That is the question. Do you want a stopgap or do you want someone for the long term? And if you're looking at the long term, Rogani's not the man. Um, but equally, if you're looking at the short term, I think there are players that are more experienced and possibly would cost less than Rogani. So I just don't see how Rogani fits on either side of that argument. I don't see how he's a stopgap, and I don't see how he's a long-term uh, answer. So it just, I don't know, that's that's kind of my thoughts on him. I only see it happening, Harry, if we get defenders out, as I mentioned. Koscielny, we're not sure what's going to happen with him. I think the club need, needs to make a decision now. Obviously, it's at a stalemate. Um, they said they went about £9 million for him. It looks like no one's willing to pay that. So are they going to have to half that fee? Are they going to have to terminate his contract or are they going to just have to put him into the under-23s and say, forget about it. Something needs to happen. It can't just be swept under the rug any more than it is. With Mustafi, I was shocked to hear last week that Monaco wanted him for a reported €30 million Euro fee. I mean, I would drive him to Monaco myself um, for, to, to get that money in. So I think if he goes, which I can't see happening, there's only a few days left, four days left of the transfer window. I can't see that happening. But if it did use that money plus whatever we have left in, in the kit and in, put that on towards a, a player that will actually get into the starting team. Because Rogani, if you think about it, a centre back, our two best centre backs or the partnership will probably be Sagratis and, and Holding, would you say? That's probably about right. Is he better than those two? Does he get into that? I don't know. And another point that's interesting, and a lot of people, you know, when we made the Pepe sign and everybody was saying, oh, 45 million budget, that was all bullshit. It wasn't necessarily, because if you think about the deals Arsenal have done, 
in terms of what they've actually put on the table right now, they probably haven't spent more than 45 million. So Arsenal have been very smart in the way they've used that money in the sense of doing longer term deals with payment structures. But do you think that Arsenal getting another defender would depend on whether they can strike a deal with somebody that is similar to the other two we've done in the sense that it will be a, a small fee up front and then payments over a long period of time. Do you think that Arsenal need to operate that way? Well, uh, I think so. I mean, I, I just want to like give a shout out to, to Raul Sanley, who, you know, everyone was talking about the 45 million budget. If you look at actually like what you're saying is pretty spot on. So Saliba, we're not going to pay any money till next next season when he comes in. Um, so Barros was a two million uh, loan. Pepe were playing twenty million up front, and um, who else? Martinelli. Was yeah, Mar- Martinelli was was cheap as well, and a Tierney would be would be twenty million up front too. So it actually fits into forty five million, uh, or just over. So what a, like an astonishing piece of business he's done with such a limited budget. And um, I made the point the other day, Harry, and we can get into this more later. But um, on the on the protests, right? If these deals would have been put through um, before, would the protest still have happened? Because for me, probably not. Because everyone was so focused on this forty-five million pound budget that was just a springboard for them to take off and have a go at everyone. But really, when you look at it, what has happened in the last year or so with the whole wholesale changes, getting rid of Arsene Wenger, getting rid of Ivan Gazidis, bringing in the whole new structure, that needs time to breathe. And for me, I just think the we care do you process was slightly premature in that sense. And I know they made a point not to talk about money, but everyone knows it's about money. I mean, you just have to read between the lines. I mean, I, I've sort of been lucky enough to be in in the WhatsApp group and etc. with the guys that are obviously running this. And I can say it's not it, for them. It's not about the money. No question about that. They've raised the number of issues that they're concerned about none of which really are transfer funds because they acknowledge that Arsenal have spent money but spent it badly. The issue is that of those 100,000 people that signed it, it's about money for a lot of them. And that's the problem. So I don't think the guys who originally set it up were going at it with that intention. But I think a lot of the people that signed it and that were reactionary towards it may have a slightly different opinion. The fact is, people have been unhappy with the way Arsenal's been run. And when a movement comes about that questions the leadership, you will get different sections of people jumping on it who perhaps have slightly differing views because they see things one way, other people see it. Now, like Even in this group of, of people, there are people that see things slightly differently. There are people that think you should go about it in one way. There are people that think you should go about it in another way. So... Whatever you do, when you're talking about such a vast amount of people and a big fan base like Arsenal have, I think you're always going to get slight differences in opinion and approach. So for me, I don't think it was necessarily about money. I do think that the time that the Cronkies addressed it was straight away and the fact that the Pepe deal was done so soon after has taken the wind out of the sails of it a little bit. Um, but I don't think that was its initial. No, and uh, look, I look. I, I, I'm not going to sound like I'm against the protest because personally, as a fan, I think as an Arsenal fan, you can't not um, be against what some of the stuff that the KSE has done over the last ten years. And but when when they're talking about atmosphere and when they're talking about forcing fans to share their cells that have been like family heirlooms, of course I agree. I'm just questioning the timing of it because, as I said, they brought in the new structure and this was the time when it needed to develop I mean why didn't they bring it in in Wenger's last season or the season before that when we were at the lowest depths you know going into the Europa League for the first time and second time and that's that's the only part of it I question I mean I never um, interrupt anyone's um, ability to be able to put their, their thoughts and opinions across and I'm glad that it did come out but I'm just not sure about the time in person and also as well um, some of our fans claiming that the only reason we spent money because of the protest they can get stuff yeah, I, I don't to be quite Yeah, because those deals would have been in motion before that was before that was announced. I, I completely agree with you there. So, of course, the season is just a few days away. Uh, Arsenal take on Newcastle at St. James's Park in our opening game. On the Sunday, the Premier League, of course, kicks off on the Friday night. Liverpool uh, take on Norwich there. Um, we've spoken a lot about who needs to come in, what we need, what we're missing. How do you think 
the beginning of the season is going to go, though, because Newcastle away is never an easy game. With Steve Bruce coming in, you're not quite sure how that's going to work. We know that Newcastle United have uh, had some issues. We know the fans were disappointed to lose Rafa Benitez. But Steve Bruce is a manager who does get his teams up for games. Uh, he's quite you know, notorious for being a, a physical manager in the sense that his teams are hard working, well drilled, etc. Um, I think it could be a potentially difficult game for Arsenal because when you think the fact that Lucas Torreira probably won't be fit and ready to start, um, a couple of the other boys have sort of, with injury doubts, we know Lacazette is touch and go, whether he's going to make it. Pepe is another one touch and go. How do you think Unai Emery is going to start the season? Will the likes of Willett get a go? Who's going to be our central defensive pairing? How, how do you see sort of uh, Unai Emery approaching this? I just wanted to pick up on Willett, um, Harry, because we were at the Emirates Cup last week. I mean, the guy is sensational. And I'm so glad that Emery's finally uh, got in touch with, with Freddie Lindbergh because he's come into uh, the, the first team set up. And I, I reckon that he's had a word with him and said, you know, Willett, you need to get him in. And he's played him over the whole preseason. And I think he, he's earned a start for me, him and, and Reese Nelson, because obviously Pepe's fitness is, uh, we're not sure about that, uh, Lacazette. So you can start Nelson and Willock and just throw him in and see what happens. I mean, with Torreira as well, for, for me, Harry, it's a lot more about the, per a lot less about the personnel, sorry, more about just the performance and how we go into the game and how we sit up, because we know it's going to be tough. St. James's Park is an awful place to go as a player. I mean, the fans are in incredible. Even you know, with the turmoil that they're going through with Mike Ashley and Steve Bruce, the manager, they didn't want whatsoever getting rid of Rafa, who was like their their talisman. Even with all of that going on, I guarantee they'll still put in 100% because they, they always do. Because they, they, they love the fans and the fans love them back. And they've got they've brought in a few players as well. Joe Linton from Hoffenheim is a very good player, so we'll have to watch out for him. For me, the most important part of it is the defence and how we line up because obviously we know Holding's not going to be back for the start of the season. Better is not going to be back for the start of the season. So it will probably be a back four similar to what we saw against Barcelona. Um, Chambers and Mustafi. And that worries me. The, the thing is as well that, and I don't want to start the season on a negative note. You never do. But when you think that if we went to Newcastle and, and didn't win, we've got Burnley in the second game of the season. You'd expect us to turn them over at the Emirates. Although we know that Sean Dyche's team's often cause us problems too. But then there's games against Liverpool and Spurs. And all of a sudden, Arsenal could have gone through the first month of the season without picking up that many points. Now, that would, of course, cause panic amongst the supporters. How long will it be before Unai Emery comes under pressure? Because, you know... I, I still can't change my feelings Agenda. on United. No, I, it, <laughs> it might be, and, it, and let me know what you think about it in the comments. It, it's, people say that to me all oh, the time. Man, it's but already, Harry. The truth is that I don't think that over the summer, this guy's all of a sudden turned into a world-class manager. I think he's a good manager. He's okay. But the problems that we've had, as we've already discussed earlier on in the show, have been at the back. And based on the transfer window... And the business we've done up to now, the time of recording, or is it Tuesday, Tuesday today, Monday, Monday afternoon? We've still not addressed those areas. So, why are people convinced? And I'm asking this as a question. I'm not saying this to have a go. Why are people so sure that this season's going to be different to the last? It's just that optimism that all Arsenal fans go into the new season with. And... <laughs> What's been happening over the last few years is that that optimism gets slapped away quicker and quicker. Sometimes it's five games, sometimes it's four games, sometimes it's one. You know, when we lost Aston Villa at home. Um, Jesus Christ, I don't want to think about that. Um, but for me, Harry, you know my thoughts on this. Emery, for me, is a stopgap. He was a stopgap to get us through that transition um, post Wenger and you know solidify us and get us back into the Champions League so if he does that it's job done and you know if when results don't go away which they ultimately will because the team is is not it's not incredible it's not an incredible team I mean it's not everyone can see it like our, our, our defensive issues are, are clear to see I mean the attack and trio are fantastic but it's not up there with the likes of, of Spurs and 
and um, and Liverpool and Man City. I mean, I think what will save us this season is the fact that the other teams around is so open. It's an, it's it's a field day for the rest of them between um, second and and below. Sorry, third and below. It's it's, it's anyone's. I mean, Wolves and Leicester will probably come up, come up into it. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because what I will say is. For all the the sort of stick I give Unai Emery and and the questions I ask of him, and I only ask those questions of him because those questions were asked of Arsene Wenger, rightly so. But Arsene Wenger was a club legend and got that sort of scrutiny. And that's the nature of managing such a huge football club. The fans are opinionated. The fans have a view. You're always going to come into question. So Unai Emery is no different in that sense. He deserves to be questioned too. Where Unai Emery does stand out here, though, is that Frank Lampard is at Chelsea. We don't know how Frank Lampard's going to get on. People say he's a bright young manager. Not convinced. I think that his Derby team did okay. Ultimately, they didn't come up. And, you know, I think that he probably thought that that was as far as he could go with them. And the Chelsea job came along and Frank Lampard wanted it and he took it. But they've got a transfer ban as well. They've lost Hazard, you know, which is the biggest thing that people talk about sort of players they can't bring in, but losing Hazard and not being able to replace him is massive. And then you've got Manchester United, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, again, a manager I'm not at all convinced about, a manager that I'm not sure will be there come the end of next season. So I think Unai Emery is the most experienced of that three and probably the most well-equipped of that three when you look at the squads overall to get that fourth Champions League spot. I do think Spurs will finish third. Um, And so I think Unai's got another real good opportunity to do it. He had a great opportunity last season, which unfortunately, for a number of reasons, and we won't get into that again today, but it didn't happen. But now he's got another glorious opportunity to get Arsenal back in the Champions League. And I just feel like if he doesn't, then the knives will come out. And in my view, it will be time for Unai Emery to move on. If come the end of this season, season. Yeah, end of the season. You've got to give him the season. There's no point. I don't believe in changing managers sort of willy-nilly in the middle of a season unless you're in the situation where you're about to you're in danger of going down and you need that recharge and you need a new manager it's the only situation in which I kind of condone it I don't think that you can do it in a situation like Arsenal in the middle of the season and I'd like to see him given the season but I will be questioning him as well yeah I mean that's a fair point and if we're in the Europa League again next season Harry then he, he needs to go I mean, it sounds ridiculous saying it now in a season preview, but Arsenal Football Club cannot be in, in that space. Like Josh Kroenke said it, and it, we're a we're a Champions League team on a Europa League budget, and that that's what we are. We can't afford it. So if we're in the Europa League next season again, you can bet your life that Aubameyang, Lacazette, they're all going to be wanting to go, and I I personally don't blame them. But what what has to happen is, as you said, no mid season sackings, and I can't see Arsenal as a sort of club to do that. To be fair given you know our history and how long we, we held on to, to Arsene Wenger as a legend, I think Emery would have been the, the sort of guy that they'd, they'd keep and, and respect. But his contract comes up to, to an end. There's an option to extend it. Surely they've got a plan in place. And this is what worries me. If it gets to May and we're looking like we're not going to finish in the, in the Champions League places, we're not in the Europa League final stages, then they need to have the next manager in line in place already. And I bet now they're putting up a list of potential replacements already because you have to. You ha- you just have to have in mind if if it all goes wrong, if it all goes tits up, you need to have that replacement ready. And as I said, he is stopgap. I think he he will steady us and get us back into Champions League because think about what's happened to the likes of Man United, who you mentioned. When Sir Alex Ferguson left, it's a complete mess. I mean, they're, they're basically been running to the ground with um with all the money they've spent. And like, think about. It. I think it was about 450 million they've spent over the last four or five seasons. I mean, that's outrageous. It is, but as well, when people say, oh, we shouldn't sack managers because we don't want to turn out like Chelsea. Well, if we win as many titles and as many trophies as Chelsea have won since Roman Abramovich has gone into that club, then I'll take that every day of the week. Because for me, it doesn't show that Roman Abramovich is a bad owner what it does show is that Roman Abramovich cares about his football team and what they do and his approach whatever you think of it has been successful because they've won Premier League titles they've won a Champions League before us they've won FA Cups they've won they've done it all under Roman Abramovich because he recognizes 
Sometimes it's been too soon, but he recognises when a manager is not cut out for the job anymore and he's not afraid to make those decisions. Now, for me, if the Cronkies sort of... And I'm not saying I want them to chop and change every five minutes, but if they add that ruthlessness to the way they're running the club, then that shows to me that they do care rather than they're running the club. I, do, I, do, I just don't think that's why they see it, Harry. I think it's a it's a very different philosophical approach to, to, to Chelsea. I think they really do try and invest in managers, um, but it does come to a point, you know, Unai Emery's not a legend like Wenger was, he, he won't be given that time, but I think the next manager after that is the one that they want to keep for a long time, and that has to be a young um, manager who's got their own philosophy and wants to implement that and will be given time, like Frank at Chelsea. And Chelsea's an interesting one because I think they've come off this, you know, 10 year period of immense success but I think they're, they're changing almost a bit and you know and Brambridge is not allowed back in the country um is he as invested as he was personally and financially that's the question you have to ask and it'll be interesting to see what happens then because personally for me I don't think Frank Lampard is is the right man for the job because he's got a year's experience there's only a certain amount that club legend status can carry you through before tactics comes into it before man management comes into it. Does he have the credentials? I don't know. I mean, he finished six with Derby, which is around about where they finish every season anyway, so he wasn't anything um, spectacular. But I just wanted to ask you, what if Emery goes, what sort of manager do you see coming in? A long term, or will it be similar to Chelsea where they keep chopping and changing? I think it will depend on, on the state of the club at the time you know, Unai Emery does eventually move on. For me, it's all about getting back in the Champions League. You've touched on it already. Arsenal need to be in that competition. Arsenal need the financial reward that comes with being in that competition. To, you know, people say, oh, we attracted Nicolas Pepe without Champions League football. Great. But how long will you hold on to the top players? You might be able to get them in the door because it's London and because we're Arsenal. And because people still see Arsenal as a Champions League club, despite the fact we're going into our third Europa League season, because we're on the cusps of getting back to where we belong. But the minute that that becomes a regular thing and people start associating us with the Europa League, then you start to have problems. And so for me, you need to get somebody with a long-term vision, but at Arsenal, it can never be that long-term, just like it could never be at Man United, it could never be at Liverpool, it could never be at Chelsea, because there is a minimum requirement for these clubs, and that is being in the Champions League. And Klopp was qualifying for the Champions League before they were winning things. Klopp was going on cup runs so that's why he got the time he's had. And now, you know, they're, they're title challengers. But you still have to tick those minimum sort of requirement boxes along the way to be given that time. And I like, I don't want this to sound like we're having to go at Unai Emery because we're not. We're just talking about what happens if we do go to the end of the season and we're in the same boat because that is a very strong possibility. Yeah, because I think that the thing we were talking about earlier is I don't see things changing. Like I, I don't see us suddenly signing Nicolas Pepe and we're back, you know, a solid top four team again. I just think with the team that we have and the balance and the sort of manager that Emery is. I mean, even before he signed Harry, he said I'd rather win a game five four than one nil, and that tells you all you need to know about his philosophy and what direction he wants to take us in. So as I said, it might be a scrap to get into the top four, but all that matters is as long as we finish there, that's it. I don't, I don't care about the football. I don't care if we win games 5-4. As long as we win and get back into the Champions League, that's all that matters. Absolutely. And for all the stick I've given Unai Emery last season and the stick that I probably will give him during certain parts of this season, if he gets back in the Champions League, I'll be the first person to put my hand up and say, job done. You've done what you were brought in to do. That brings us to the end of another edition of the Chronicles of Aguna. Massive thanks to my guest today, Mike Stavrou, and to all of you guys. We've now reached 2,500 subscribers on YouTube. Might not sound like a lot to some, uh, but to us it's incredible. Big thank you to every single one of you who subscribed, liked, shared our videos, left a comment, uh, and we'll be back very soon with more. Until then, take care. This is a Sofa Sports Media production. Follow us on Twitter at Sofa Sports Media. Subscribe to our Premier League show by searching for Sofa Sports Media on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you download them from. Join the Sofa Sports Media family to enjoy lots of exclusive content for the 2019 20 season. Sofa Sports Media. Subscribe, enjoy, and join the discussions.